You are listening to the Through the Bible Studio Series with Pastor Nate Holdridge. Join us as we continue our study through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Here's Nate. Proverbs 17 begins with the beautiful verse, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Now, feasting here might actually allude to meat derived from the festal sacrifices. You remember when they would go to offer their sacrifices to God, it was during, normally, a feast that God had prescribed for the people of Israel. So it was a time of celebration. So the idea here could be that it is better to have just a dry morsel with quiet than to have a house that has all of this religious feasting and this look of spirituality, yet is in sin and has strife. This is the age-old problem, in a sense, of hypocrisy in worship. Paul, of course, teaches us in the New Testament, in places like Ephesians 5 and 6, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is to chase us into our home life. In fact, actually right there in Ephesians 5 and 6, Paul had a vision of the gospel of Jesus Christ so affecting the church and the church being so connected to its head, Jesus, that husbands would become lovers of their wives as Christ loved the church, that fathers would become gentle and kind and minister to their children, and that masters would actually serve their slaves. This was a vision that Paul saw for the church that is only possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's better to have a real genuine thing happening in your home life and have, you know, a little, not have a lot, it's better to have something genuine and spiritual and true to happen in your in your everyday life than it is to be a person of great wealth or to go around looking as if you have spirituality when you don't. Now, uh, when you see a phrase like this, better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with, with strife, it does bring up thoughts regarding minimalism or at least the idea of minimalism, which I don't confess to be an expert on, but seems to teach the idea that a life filled with a minimal or necessary amount of belongings and things can actually lead to a fuller life. The thing about minimalism, though, is that it can become a gospel for someone by which a person is saved and by which a person is made valuable, which actually just lends to an unsaving legalistic message. But there are some redemptive elements inside of it. And it would be good for us, especially if you live in a materialistic culture and society like I do, to take hold of proverbs like these to say, you know, the reality is I'd rather have a little with quiet and peace than to have a whole lot but have to strive after it. Now in verse 2, he goes on to say, A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. Here, what we're seeing is that the wise work of a faithful servant leads, in general, to advancement. Now, when you're reading this, one thing that is suggested is that there are long years attached to the servant working in that particular household. And the reason why that's suggested is because the contrast is between the servant and the son. And one of them receives an inheritance with the brothers, and it's actually the faithful servant. So it's not hard to imagine that a servant 
who is there for six months or a year would ever qualify for replacing a rebellious son in the family will. But you could imagine long years of a life of faithfulness actually producing that in an ancient family structure. So, you know, as we look at this and see that wise work faithfully, diligently throughout the years will lead to advancement is the idea of the proverb. We have to remember that this is the ideal. You know, we live in an era where obviously in many circles, you might be unfairly kept from ever advancing, even if you are faithful. Uh, your ethnicity, your gender, the way you look might unfairly be used as a way to discriminate against you, and you might be kept from ever advancing. But the general rule, especially amongst God's people, is this. Look, hey, walk with the Lord, be faithful, keep working, and watch how he advances your life. The crucible, verse 3, is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. This is so beautiful because what we're seeing here is that it's the Lord who is purifying our hearts. Silver goes into the crucible, gold goes into the furnace to burn away impurities, but the Lord, he works hard to burn away the impurities of our hearts. One way that he does that, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, is that he tests the genuineness of our faith, burns away the impurities of it through the fire of trials. So the Lord, he is ever faithfully working on us. An evildoer, verse 4, listens to wicked lips, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. Uh, this is emphasizing the readiness and eagerness of the wicked to listen to evil. You know, they're, they're ready. They're giving ear. They're listening to it. They long to receive it. Whoever, verse 5, mocks the poor, insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. You know, it's, it's a dangerous thing for a person, according to this proverb, to mock the poor, to have a, an attitude of those who are in poverty that is dismissive and trite or is in some way ridiculing of the reality of their poverty. Why would this, as the proverb says, insult the maker? Well, in a sense, it might insult the maker because it might create or profess a false equivalency between God's sovereignty and that person's poverty. In other words, it might be an insult in the sense that someone is saying, well, they are poor because God in his sovereign will and plan made them so. Rather than looking out and saying, perhaps the Lord wants me to do something about that person's poverty. But also, the probably the bigger reason that it insults the maker is because the maker, God, identifies with the poor. And so our treatment, your treatment of the poor is indicative of your treatment of God. Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus spoke of his return and spoke of a time when they would say, Lord, when did we do these things for you? And he'll say, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so the way that we treat the poor, in a sense, is the way that we are treating the Lord. That is how closely he identifies with those who are in poverty. Now, in verse 6, he goes on to say, Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their father. One of the things about coming into Christ Jesus is that as you wrestle with the New Testament and as you think about what Christ has done for you, uh, you are or should get a redeemed and new vision of the family structure. You know, what could it look like? What could it be? Here you have this family where grandchildren are the crown of the aged and the glory of children is their father's. It's not hard, though, to look out into our society and see grandchildren that are a shame to their grandparents. 
And it's not hard at all to see children who their father is not a glorious man, but their father is someone who has brought shame or confusion or sin into their lives. But as believers, we get a brand new thing where this beautiful statement can come to pass. Get a vision for your life considering that you could have, as the generations progress, if you don't have them already, grandchildren that are a crown to you because they're walking with God, they're loving the Lord, they're, they're, they know his word, they're a gift to the church. And consider the possibility of within your family, the fathers scattered all throughout it, that they would be men who are loving and serving and caring for their children. So this is a real vision-inspiring kind of proverb. Now, verse 7, the next proverb says, Fine speech is not becoming to a fool. Still less is false speech to a prince. So both of these are bad. The fine speech just doesn't look good on a fool. But false speech is actually worse on a prince. And the, the reality of that is because princes are in authority. And when a, an authoritative person, a person in authority, uh, begins to lie, false speech is what it says here, then the whole code of honor is crippled. And everything underneath them and the people that follow them will be regularly tempted to give in to a lesser code of conduct because at the top, the main code of honor and truth-telling has been crippled. No, a ruler should be a person of integrity and honesty and trustworthiness. A, a ruler should put the meaning back into the title noble and behave nobly. Verse 8 goes on to say, A bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Here, he talks about a bribe being like a magic stone or a lucky charm or a lucky stone. And he says, it's like wherever this person turns, they prosper because of this magic stone that they have. Now, this is not an endorsement of bribery, but an acknowledgement of its effectiveness. And as you look around in this world, uh, the reality is corruption abounds on the face of the earth. Even if you're living in one of the more civilized nations on earth, you still are dealing with corruption. But then as you ponder the nations around the globe, what you discover is that corruption is actually normative. So the proverb isn't saying that we should engage in it, but it's saying this is the reality. Corruption does exist. It's not effective in the sense that it produces good overall, but for the person engaging in it, it has this strange effect of getting what they want done. Now, in verse 9, he says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Here you have two different avenues. You can either cover an offense or you can repeat a matter. And if you repeat a matter, you're going to separate friends. And if you cover an offense, you're seeking love. You see, friendship requires the ability to forget. In verse 10, a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows to a fool. Now, in verse 10 to 16, each verse is going to refer to some form of an evil or foolish action and person. And here, the first of this cluster of Proverbs addressed or about the fool, we have an idea that 100 blows or lashes, which was well beyond the legal limit of 40 in those days, is not sufficient to alter the course of a fool. But for a man of understanding, all he needs is a simple rebuke. You see, the wise person doesn't really need all that much to alter their course. They're very sensitive. They're in tune. They're ready and willing to be corrected and to find a better way. An evil man, verse 11, seeks only rebellion, and a cruel messenger will be sent 
against him. Here you have a guarantee of retribution when you're doing evil. Now, of course, we look around the world and we see all kinds and types of evil that our retribution has not occurred. And, and of course, as believers, we understand that a day is coming when the wrath of God will meet all of the evil of this earth. But in general, as this proverb addresses generalities, especially there in ancient Israel, the concept was in Israel that if you were evil and if you were cruel, then you would expect evil and cruelty to come back upon you. Let a man, verse 12, meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. So tell me that humor is not part of the Bible and I'll show you this verse. I mean, just the idea here is that, you know, such hyperbole and such humor, you'd rather meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs, just this raging mama bear, than a fool in his folly. There's just nothing that you can do with him. Verse 13, if anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. You know, if you are, someone does good to you and you return it with evil, uh, what he's saying is that evil is not going to depart from your home. This seems to mean that evil will be a constant stain of the, or on the environment of that house, of that home. And you see that with people who have allowed their morals to become upside down, twisted, reversed from what the Bible has taught and received, you can see that there is just this darkness that exists in that home. Verse 14 says, The beginning of strife is like letting out water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. I, I love this proverb. It's so practical, so helpful for the way in which we do relationships. It's saying that conflicts must be stopped before they get out of control. You know, the truth is that families and relationships and churches have been destroyed by the smallest spark of strife. And so here he's telling us that we must quit before the quarrel breaks out. Romans 12 verse 18 tells us, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your own hands as we instructed you. And 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Now in verse 15, he goes on to say, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. What you're seeing here is the reversal of morality that I just spoke about a couple of verses ago. The idea that someone would call wicked good and righteousness evil. This is what you see in Romans chapter 1. It's called the debased mind. Romans 1 verse 28, Paul describes there in Romans chapter 1 a culture or a society of people who have refused to acknowledge a creator God who is majestic and over them and worthy of their worship. And he tells them that God gives up cultures and societies like that. And as he gives them up, they then pursue three things. The first thing that they pursue is sexual immorality in a widespread sense. The second the thing that they pursue is unnatural sexuality in a ever-increasing sense. And the third thing that they pursue or that they possess is a debased mind. Minds that do what ought not to be done, Romans 1 verse 28. And in so doing, they not only do them, he says there in Romans 1, but verse 32, they give approval to those who practice them. And that's what we're seeing here in Proverbs 17 verse 15, the justification of the wicked and the condemnation of the righteous. This is what happens when a culture removes itself, a society removes itself from God. But fortunately, through the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, our minds and our bodies and our souls can be renewed. Now, in verse 16, he says, Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom 
when he has no sense. So money here, of course, is not the resource the fool needs to buy wisdom. He must have a sense for wisdom. He must have a heart for wisdom, along with an intention, a desire to get wisdom. You know, the picture here is that there's a fool standing there with money in his hand, but it's not money that can actually purchase the very thing that he needs. What he needs is an eager heart. What he needs is sense. What he needs is a spirit that desires that wisdom. This speaks of the humility that's required to actually grow. A friend, verse 17, loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, in this verse, the friend and the brother are equated together. In chapter 18, we're going to see that a friend is extolled above a brother, a relative, but here they're seen as equal. Uh, They complement each other. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. The idea here is that the love of a true friend is strong and constant. It causes us to think of or to remember the deep friendship between David and Jonathan in the Old Testament era. One, verse 18, who lacks sense, gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Here we learn that it is foolish to pledge security for someone else's loans. In other words, it's not wise to get involved in foolish financial investments. This is good for us to know because what we're learning is this is not loving. This is not friendship. And so the question is, can you say no to the bad ideas your friends will inevitably find themselves getting into. I know for me, I want to have friends in my life who when I am beginning to enter into something that is maybe even financially foolish, that they would look at me and say, no, you you don't want to do that, that they'd be willing to speak. Whoever, verse 19, loves transgression, loves strife. And he who makes his door high seeks destruction. The words used here are figurative. Many think that what he's saying is that a door, you know, if you think about what a door is, well, a door is an opening into a home. So if this is figurative, then perhaps what the figure is of is of the human mouth, which is also your main opening. It's the one that you consume and you speak from. You eat food and you speak out of. So if that's what he's saying, then to make the door high could be a figure of saying lofty things, high things, proud things with that mouth of yours. So it's a difficult verse to translate, but it might be that he's saying this is a person who brags too much. A man of crooked heart, verse 20, does not discover good, and one with a dishonest tongue falls into calamity. Or, I like the way the Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it, one with a twisted mind will not succeed, and one with deceitful speech will fall into ruin. Verse 21, he who sires a fool gets himself sorrow, And the father of a fool has no joy. You know, the truth is that it is not always a completely joy-filled experience to have children. And not with the world and with human nature as they are. I mean, look at this. If you have a fool for a child, it's a sorrowful experience. Now, two words for fool are used here in verse 21. The first word speaks of a dullness, and the second word speaks of a lack of spiritual sensitivity. And that is one of the most discouraging things for a godly parent when they look at their child and they realize this person is not concerned with the things of God at all. There, there's, a, there's a spiritual deadness inside of them. They are not awake and alive to the things of God. And so this is where prayer for our children comes into play. Now in verse 22, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. The truth of this proverb is that one's psychological condition affects one's physical condition. A healthy attitude, in other words, fosters good health, but a depressed spirit ruins health. 
And so to allow the joy of the Lord to come into our lives, this is why the relationship with Jesus that we are given access to is so important. Because as he talked to us of it in places like John chapter 15 and told us to abide in him and that he would abide in us like branches abiding in the vine, the vine abiding in the branches, that we would bear fruit from our lives. And he said, these things I have told you that your joy may be full. The only way for us to have the fruit of joy blooming from our lives is for us to be in regular fellowship and friendship and connection with Jesus. He is the one that satisfies our souls. He is all we need. The wicked, verse 23, accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the ways of justice. So in verse 8, there was a reference to the fact that bribes often help people get what they want. We've already seen that. But this verse affirms the purpose of the bribes bribes. It perverts or it bends justice. Verse 24, the discerning sets his face toward wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. I love this verse because it seems to speak of an inability for the fool to concentrate. His eyes are all over the place. They're on the ends of the earth. He can't think about wisdom. He's just looking everywhere else. It speaks of the folly of looking everywhere, even for wisdom, but never finding it. As the New Living Translation says, a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. The fool cannot concentrate. He cannot focus. This might have something to say to our internet distracted brains. And one of the most valuable assets that you have for God, for his kingdom, for his glory, for the relationships and the people around you is the mind that God has given to you. But if you allow your mind to be trained and retrained time and time again to respond to external stimuli and to always be uh, flitting about here and there on various websites and apps and, and social media and all of that, which can be good in its proper context, but if you are addicted to it, You're going to have such a hard time getting your mind to be able to concentrate on the things of God. Cultivate the ability to think long and hard. Verse 25, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. This is often grief that is connected to the father's own folly as we look out at the world And so here you have a foolish son who's a grief to his father. That father, even if he was not there for his child, is grieved by his son's disobedience. To impose, verse 26, a fine on a righteous man is not good, nor to strike the noble for their uprightness. This speaks of unjust punishments, which is such a stain in the world. Whoever, verse 27, restrains his words has knowledge And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. The idea here is not that to restrain words means that you have knowledge or that to have a cool spirit means that you have understanding. The idea is that restrained words and a cool spirit flow from a person with knowledge and understanding. You know, because as you look at the world, if you have knowledge and understanding of the things of God, of the kingdom of Christ, then you're not going to panic. You're not going to speak rashly. You're not going to, you know, freak out. You you know where all of this is going. You aren't easily fired up. You're temperate. You can see God's involvement in human history. And then finally, our last proverb of chapter 17, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Even fools appear wise in silence, in other words. It doesn't mean that they, of course, become wise through their silence. They might have plenty of folly inside those brains of theirs. But by concealing their folly, they at least look wise for a moment. So this seems like a good place for me to be silent and to stop this teaching. God bless you and amen. Thank you for listening. For additional resources and teachings, or to contact us, please visit us at nateholdridge.com.